This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. So our long, pa- long table speaker today is Ben Lee Damsky, who has a special interest in Roman Republican, Imperial, and Provincial coinages. And as Peter mentioned, I first got to know uh, Ben Lee some back when I was a postdoc at the Yale University Art Gallery, uh, where he is, of course, an important benefactor. Uh, he endowed the Uh, Curator of Ancient Coinage, who bears the title of the Ben Lee Damsky Curator, uh, the first incumbent of which was William E. Metcalf, and the current holder of that position is Ben Hillings. Um, He also donated a remarkable collection of uh, Roman imperial and provincial coins to the Yale collection, including the best known example of Trajan's Circus Maximus Cistercius, and last time I was there it was still on uh, display in the permanent gallery. I'm not sure if it still is or not. Um, Ben Lee Damsky also has strong links with the American Numismatic Society, where he's been a member since 1976 and a fellow since 1993. And he has lectured on occasion at the Society's graduate seminar and is a donor of over 100 high quality Roman coins to the ANS collection. Uh, Among the, uh, and I was looking at this the other day, uh, uh, the objects he's donated to the ANS. Uh, among those, my favorite piece is uh, the Aureus of Septimius Severus that depicts the stadium of Domitian, which I believe is one of only about five that are known. Um, he is also the author of various numismatic articles, and uh, I know a couple of them pretty well because I've looked at them a lot, read them a lot. Uh, so for example, the Stadium Aureus of Septimius Severus and AJN 1990, and the throne and curule chair types of Titus and Domitian in the Swiss Numismatic Review 1995. So uh, with that, uh, take it away, Ben Lee. Thank you very much, Nathan, and, and welcome to you all. Uh, here's, the, uh, here's our subject medallion. Uh, it's Antoninus Pius and this mysterious figure on the reverse, um, first published in the BM British Museum's uh, medallion book uh, by uh, Gruber. And um, it was identified there as Sylvanus, the, uh, the forest god. And uh, that's what Necky followed when, when he published his medallion book. And more recently, uh, Peter Mittag has, has begun moving through the Roman medallions. And uh, he treated this piece and, and cited uh, an unpublished uh, speech by uh, a Professor uh, Noli who called this uh, uh, Icarius. Well, uh, I'm going to deal with both of these and show that those identifications are wrong. Then I'll give you the correct one and explain why. So let's see. Well, it's not moving. That does it, okay. Um, That's the legend, and the TRP number gives us this date, uh, 155 to uh, 156, and since uh, most of these were for January 1st, I think this was for January the 1st, 156. Here it is blown up. And you see the the figure there. Uh, have a good look, and I'll, I'll move on. Now, what I see is a young man. He's got a tree beside him, and he's holding a branch. He's got a hammer in his lowered hand. There's a dog. Uh, over at the right, there's a wine crater sitting on top of an altar. So those are the, that's the iconography we need to deal with. But well, first it's not Sylvanus. Uh, here's Sylvanus on a, 
uh, on a stele in, in the capital line. Uh, and he holds a pruning knife, uh, Roman falk. Uh, but that's a knife. And what our young man holds is, is a hammer. Furthermore, this is a mature man, bearded and, uh, and full of stature. And we have a, we have a young guy. Here he is on a wonderful medallion of, of Hadrian, uh, again with, with the beard. Uh, there is a dog there next to the altar uh, because he, uh, he also uh, oversaw the, the flocks in the fields. Um, it's not Icarius. Uh, you may not know the name Icarius. Here he is, uh, again, a mature man. He was the first human uh, who was taught by Dionysus to raise grapes and make wine. Um, but, um, and, and met a, a bad end. <laughs> Some guys got drunk and murdered him. Uh, uh, but uh, again, a bearded mature man and, and furthermore, Acarius to my knowledge, has never appeared on either a Greek or a Roman coin. So it's kind of funny if he would show up on this medallion. Um, well, I'm going to add a couple of other things that I think I see. A lame foot and a cap. But I can't say either of those for certain. But it's what it looks like to me. You, you see something on top of his head is it uh, is it a cap or is it just hair not very well shown and the his, what i'm talking about is his left foot is kind of twisted and the heel is raised so i claim that this is kabirus he's a Tonic savior god. He is uh, often said to be one of the sons of Hephaestus. And he and his, he's often shown uh, as a pair, uh, very similar to the Dioscuri. And most importantly, he is strongly associated with the mysteries of Samothrace. Here he is. Uh, on a provincial coin of Thessaloniki. Uh, he's wearing a workman's uh, outfit and he's carrying a, a riton, a, a wine cup. And then over his shoulder, he's got a hammer. Here is a uh, tetradram of Pergamum, which Andy Meadows has, well, Andy Meadows has assigned this to Pergamum from about 160 BCE. And I think we, we'd all say that this is, uh, we see the Dioscuri there, but it's not because uh, uh, they're labeled. If you look here, it's the Kibiri. Uh, so let's look at, here's another one. The riton, but this is a proton riton, as you clearly see, a fancy one. Can't see the top of the hammer here. Here he is again, same kind of stuff. And again, a little bit later with the portrait of Julia Domna. So a word about mystery cults. They were... Uh, Cults that required initiation. You didn't just walk into the temple or walk up to an altar and make a sacrifice. You had to make an effort. <clears throat> they held a ceremony that um, was always at night and in a rural setting. And the rural setting, I believe, explains the, the tree in the, uh, in the medallion. It's showing us that the setting is out in the woods. Uh, 
the mystery cults are called mystery because secrecy was imposed on the initiates. In particular, the mysteries of Samothrace. Well, we say Samothrace, but this are very similar uh, mystery ceremonies were held, especially at Limnos and Thebes, but that, that's Thebes in Greece. They were, the, the subjects were called the great gods. And we, we aren't given the names except indirectly or by inference and, and some commentators. It was a Kabiris, Hermes, and a mother that we know were there. And the mother is probably the, the, uh, the great mother, Magna Mater or the Kibli, uh, coming from Phrygia. And we know that in, at Samothrace, the ceremonies involved a lot of wine drinking. The archaeologists have found uh, thousands of simple conical cups that were used to, to drink the wine. Uh, and I'm just going to comment now that if you're holding a conical cup, you can't put it down and, and leisurely finish your drink. There's no way to put it down. You have to finish it. So it encourages, uh, it encourages drinking. We also know that the attendees, the initiates of the Mysteries of Samothrace, were given two gifts to take home with them. One was a, an iron ring that was gold plated to make it special, but it was, it was magnetic. And if you had one of these rings, you could recognize another initiate by putting your, your ring uh, hand close to the other person's and see if the magnets uh, reacted. And they were given a purple sash and you will remember in, in our, our, our reverse that there's a, a long sash in the background or, or around the, the Kabiris. Uh, I also need to mention the, um, the mythical figure Cadmos. He was a Phoenician prince, not quite sure which city. And his father tasked him with going and finding his sister, Europa. Uh, never did find her, by the way. Uh, but there is a little bit parallel of a parallel with Demeter looking for her daughter. Cadmos, the first stop we are aware of, he stopped at Samothrace. And we know he was there because it's, they say that he married there. He went on to go to Greece where he brought the alphabet. So that's part of the story that the alphabet came from Phoenicia to, uh, to Greece. And, uh, and that's what modern authorities think today that the Greek alphabet was an adaptation of, uh, of, uh, of uh, a Semitic alphabet uh, from areas like uh, Phoenicia. Uh, he went on to fight a dragon and found the city of Thebes. So Cadmos is associated with Samothrace and, and, and with Thebes, two of the three main cult centers for uh, for these mysteries. And he also had a daughter named Ino. Uh, and uh, she is plays a part in the Odyssey. In book five, uh, 
I know has been changed into the goddess, the white goddess, uh, Leucothea. And uh, Odysseus is escaping from Circe. And she, uh, and he, he builds himself a raft and he sails away and everything goes well until Poseidon catches sight of him that he's out on the sea again and he clobbers him with a terrible storm. <coughs> well, Leucothea appears to him and she gives him a sash and she tells him, take off all your clothes and put on the sash and then jump off your raft into the water. Odysseus is a suspicious type and he waits till the last minute, but as his raft breaks up, he takes off the clothes and puts on the sash and jumps into the water. And instantly the, the, the storm stops and he is brought to an island. And following his instructions, when he's safe on the beach, he takes the sash off and throws it into the water without watching. But uh, Homer tells us that uh, I know picked the sash up and disappeared. Here's uh, some coins of, uh, of Cadmos. Uh, in this wonderful rare piece, he's, uh, he's giving the alphabet to the, uh, to the Greeks uh, and they're named Helens, E-L-L-E. Uh, and he is Cad, K-A-D. Here he is again, fighting the dragon uh, that led to, to founding Thebes. Uh, I'm gonna show the, uh, this is the Northern Aegean. And this, this island is uh, Thassos. And that's the name of the, the brother of Cadmos. This is Samothrace, the island we're talking about. And if I can point, that's just about where the sanctuary was. This is Embros, uh, and this is Lemnos. Uh, Lemnos is where, um, where Hephaestus fell to earth and, uh, and uh, the uh, these, uh, these mysteries were celebrated there and uh, to a lesser extent at, at Ambrose. Well, I don't know how to go back. Let's see, will that do it? There we go. Uh, here's here's the, the most of the Aegean. So here are the uh, those islands we were looking at, but down here, this is Athens, that white area. And up here, this is Thebes, where the, the other cult center of this mystery was. And I also mentioned that um, this is the island of Lesbos. And one of the important buildings at the, at the sanctuary here was uh, donated by the people of Mytilene on Lesbos. Now, I can also say that Kabiris was a symbol of, or at least on some occasions, a symbol of Macedonia. Here is a, uh, a coin of the Koinon of Macedonia, and you see Athena, a military Athena, and clearly the little figure she's, she's holding is is Kabiris. Uh, now, this is this coin is also interesting because it says Omanoia, or, or, or harmony. This is a, a normally a treaty coin, and what you expect to see is the two gods or goddesses of cities, which might or might not be named. 
but there, there is only only one main figure there, um, and yet it says uh, Omanoia. But you have to understand that Roman Macedonia. Uh, I, I, well, I want to say that the occasion was the 300th anniversary of the foundation of Macedonia. The, uh, the, third, uh, the third Macedonian war that, that Rome fought was uh, against uh, King Perseus, and um, he was defeated at Pydna and uh, totally routed, and, and he ran away to the island of uh, Samothrace, where he was captured. Uh, so Ro Rome uh, responded by breaking up his kingdom into four client kingdoms that were republics, actually. Um, but uh, squabbling began, and finally a, a pretender appeared, this guy. Uh, and started a revolt. So Rome sent an army over, and when they settled this, they, uh, they reformulated the province of Macedonia. So it wasn't uh, after the Battle of Pydna, it was about 20 years later. Samothrace was favored clearly by the kings of Macedonia, we see several buildings uh, dedicated by them. And the most famous thing, I'm sure, is the, uh, the, the, uh, the statue of victory of Samothrace, and now at the Louvre, there and there. And uh, to get an idea of what it looked like, especially for us numismatists, uh, here is here, here is this coin of this Macedonian coin, um, very similar victory on on a ship's prow, no doubt um, commemorating some naval victory. Whoops. Well, now I want to say something about this apotropaic or protective scarf, the one that. Uh, Homer treated, and and uh, and who was who saved which saved Odysseus? That appears on some coins, and I don't think this phenomenon has been recognized. So here, starting in Tarentum, we see the uh, Taurus, who's being saved by the dolphin, but you see here. This doesn't happen all the time, but in a number of the, the dies, he's got a sash. Oh, I'm going backwards. Okay. Here's a close-up. And here's a, another coin of Tarentum, another sash. And um, again, this time, the the... The figure is is uh, wielding a, 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 a trident and uh, holding out just like the uh, well, I'll skip these. Uh, just like the coin we looked at on the other side, you see that uh, Poseidon has got. Uh, I'm going to call it a sash or or a cloth. A, a special cloth. Um, the catalog described this as a net. And you might think a net is appropriate for Poseidon, but I see no indication that that's a net. That's an apotropaic sash. And this continues on Roman coins. Just to bring you back and have you look at the sash here. You see it goes uh, over his thigh and then back over uh, around his arm and onto his shoulder. And <clears throat> uh, uh, 
it's it's said that this was attached to the thigh. Now here's a uh, here's a denarius of Commodus, and you see uh, Jupiter with a similar sash, and it's going by his thigh. Uh, here that was the denarius. Here's uh, a sestertius, and here's a coin, a denarius of Septimius Severus, much more parallel to that uh, Poseidon we were looking at. Uh, there's a, a sash over Jupiter's arm, and uh, Jupiter is fighting for us. And another one under Gallienus. There's another phenomenon Starting with Trajan, we see coins like this, where Jupiter is the conserver of the emperor. And there is a, a text in Tacitus where he describes Domitian having built a, uh, a temple to Jupiter Custodi. And uh, at that temple, he says that uh, Domitian put in his statue in the folds of Jupiter. That's, he uses the word folds as in drapery folds. And it's always been translated as in the lap or in the arms of Jupiter. But we see from these coins that it really is literally in the folds, and the folds are meant to be apotropaic. So this is Trajan on an Arius, same thing on a Sestertius, and, and here's Commodus, same thing again. Well, that's my story. Uh, this is Kabiris, and uh, and we, through, the, through understanding this medallion, we see that uh, there is such a thing as an apotropaic sash and that it appears on both Greek and Roman coins. Okay, and any questions? Thank you very much, Ben Lee. Uh, any questions, comments? Hi, it's Rick Belson. Hi, Rick. Hey, uh, congratulations on a very nice uh, talk. I was just wondering, uh, uh, is this a unique point of view or have others suggested it as well? No, the, on, the only suggestions that have been made before were Sylvanus uh, and uh, Strack actually, uh, I think he noticed that the figure was too young. So he didn't say it was Sylvanus. He said it was a woodland spirit. Mm. And then a Professor Nole has suggested uh, <coughs> Icarius. And that those are the only suggestions I'm aware of. The uh, uh, the website of the British Museum presents this coin and, and describes it as Sylvanus. Mm. Okay. Well, once again, congratulations on a great presentation. And I see you have your new copy of RIC3 on the bookshelves. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> I try to keep up. Oh, by the way, I, 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 let me let me just put in a word of, of praise there. Uh, not only do I appreciate the uh, uh, the work of the new volume, uh, but in particular, if they have followed the um, precedent set by Bernard Wojtek and uh, and incorporated the medallions as well. So. Uh, the, uh, the, the volume is not only by uh, Richard Abdi, but uh, uh, Peter Franz Mittag is a, is a co-author. 
because the medallions are incorporated there. Um, he's published, um, he's, he's been publishing the medallions uh, and has done a, a couple of volumes. Um, and I suppose he's going to continue, but uh, the, the plates in, in the RIC are, are, are better and so preferred. And, and the language is English, which helps some of us. Any other questions or comments for Ben Lee? Um, yes, this is Susan. Um, as I recall, there's another Antonius Pius. Can't remember if it's a coin or just a medal. And the and the reverse has a has a man with a crown, kind of, and a bowl of fruit or grapes. Uh, what is that? a similar type of medallion? Well, uh, I, I, I don't think so. If, if uh, the holding of fruit or grapes sounds like it could be uh, fee days, it's sometimes seen that way. Um, but uh, I would think that it's, I'd be hard pressed to explain a, a figure as Kabiris if there wasn't some wine around. Because every time Kabiris is mentioned, there's wine there. Mm -hmm. I see. Well, thank you for a great, great presentation. Thank you. So, uh, Ben Lee, uh, the um, uh, one question I had, and I see uh, somebody else posted similar in the chat, is um, do you have any ideas as to, to why this particular individual, why this design would appear on a, on a medallion of Antoninus Pius? You know, one of the things that, that Mittag has, has written about with his, uh, in his book on the medallions of Antoninus Pius and in some of his articles is you know, there's a lot of these really kind of um, detailed mythological types, which are unlike the, the coinage, and they refer oftentimes to um, dynastic events through, through a sort of metaphor or relate to the um, health issues or well-being of the family. Um, and so I'm wondering if maybe there's some connection there. Have you, have you given any thought to, to, to what the political or ideological significance might be? Uh, yes. Um, if you remember, I, I showed the, uh, the Koinon of Macedon coin uh, in which the figure was really identified by, by using this Kabiris. Uh -huh. so I, I believe that, that Kabiris stands for Macedonia. And I believe that the date that this appeared for January the 1st, 156, because that was the 300th anniversary of the, the setting up the foundation of the Roman province of Macedonia. Uh, I'll also mention that um, uh, before he was emperor, Antoninus Pius served a term as governor of Asia. And, uh, and we know that, that he was initiated into the uh, mystery, mysteries of, uh, uh, of Eleusis. And I'm going to speculate that he may well have been initiated into the mysteries of Samothrace as well. But basically, I believe that, that he's not so much trying to honor this shadowy minor figure, Kabiris, as he is the province Macedonia. Great, thank you. Uh, and I can't remember, did you mention how many specimens were of this one are known, or is it, is it unique? Uh, I didn't mention it. There are five, five, five specimens, 
all from the same dye pair. Okay, oh, that's interesting. So it's, we've never found a, a second reverse dye for, for this type. Okay. But it's just wonderful that there's such a, a nice specimen at the British Museum. Great, right, thank you. Any other uh, questions for Ben Lee? I don't know if you're seeing um, the chat, but we've got uh, several people thanking you for your presentation. Well, thank you. Uh, David Vagie asks, uh, what was the intended audience and why? Uh huh. Well, um, that gets into some interesting questions too. Um, it would seem that um, some audience, and because it's on a medallion, I really think it's the upper levels, the senatorial class that are being addressed with a medallion. Um, at Ninus Pius or his mint master, uh, seems to assume that they will recognize this figure, that they're familiar with the mysteries of Samothrace and with Kabiris. Uh, there is no legend. This, as, as in many of the medallions, there's no legend giving any description of the scene. You're supposed to know. Hi, David. <laughs> what else? All right. Well, thank you very much for your talk. Good to see you. Uh, I don't think I've had the chance to see you in person for many years now, but hopefully, hopefully um, we'll be able to get together as this pandemic uh, winds down. And uh, thank you for a great talk and lecture. Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.